stuff ability. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to, uh, and of course we have two days of uh, this conference, that's from 12 to 4 p.m. That is again for your convenience, we have made this time slot. And uh, so hope you will uh, enjoy the two days of, uh, we have about six symposia covering all the aspects of uh, disability, uh, talking to you uh, the, by the experts. It could be medical professionals, the therapists, or the social workers who are uh, dealing with patients. Uh, so I would like to invite to start the proceedings uh, to give a welcome uh, address uh, by the by Professor Samad Dharmaratna, who is the president of the SLMA. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Saraji, and uh, welcome all of you who are joining virtually the second medical rehabilitation conference organized by the expert committee on medical rehabilitation, rehabilitation of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I should uh, specially thank uh, Madam Padma Gunratna, who is the immediate past president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association also, who is the chairperson of this committee for organizing this conference uh, for the second time in succession. So this is a continuous second time. Thank you very much, Madam, and I hope you continue this uh, in future also continuously. And uh, let give me a minute to talk about uh, rehabilitation. This is very, very required because I think all of you know that traumatic injuries have been the leading cause of hospital admissions for the past 20 years or more, as well as it has been the leading in the first 10 leading causes of hospital deaths also for the same period of time. So with this, there is a lot of basically people who need rehabilitation and injuries is not the only cause that people need rehabilitation. So this is a very important, timely conference. And again, thank you all of you who joined as well as all the members of the expert committee for organizing this. and. Hope that you have a very interesting and a productive conference for today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, the chairperson of the Experts Committee uh, in Medical Rehabilitation, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, who is the pillar behind all these events and the success. Over to you, madam. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Saraji. Uh, thank you uh, for all of you for joining uh, this very important event of the academic activities of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Now, um, uh, this uh, uh, initially, uh, let me thank Professor Samad Dharmaratna for accepting the invitation of the uh, SLMA Medical uh, rehabilitation, the Committee for SLMA Medical Rehabilitation uh, to address the inaugural address of this uh, conference. As it was mentioned by uh, Dr. Saraji and Professor Samat Dharmaratna, this is our second conference and the initial one was last year. And in fact, we started this committee all together in last, uh, I mean, one before the last 20 20 uh, because we wanted to do activities on rehabilitation in 2021. So you know that how uh, how backwards or how much uh, uh, poor developed, how, how much less developed the rehabilitation here in Sri Lanka. The rehabilitation per se is not the responsibility of the one particular category, but the, 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 uh, the specific feature or the characteristic feature of rehabilitation is that it encompasses the many categories of health staff and a very basic uh, skill of anyone with interest in rehabilitation is being able to do teamwork. So we organize this conference as a team from the medical uh, SLMA expert committee in medical rehabilitation. So there are, I mean, as I told you, we 
as medical professionals, physiotherapists, nurses, occupational therapists, speech therapists, uh, and the counselors. So we all together have organized this conference because that, uh, I mean, we are at a time, say previously, we used to sort of grumble to say that we do not get opportunities for us to take part in international conferences. But now, because that we are together, we have been able to conduct our own conference, and then if necessary, to join with international conferences as well. So we uh, uh, decided on this time for the benefit and for to make it easy for all of us to join, and we have it on to consecutive days as it was already mentioned and uh, uh, to make it convenient for all of us uh, see to, and to see that we all make use of our, uh, uh, or the uh, get the benefits of this conference we have made it free for all and there is no payment and from anywhere that you are you can join the conference and make use of the uh, uh, knowledge that is being shared in this conference. And in the program, we have taken the aspects, all aspects in rehabilitation and the interests of all categories of staff, and then have developed the uh, uh, academic program of this conference so that each and every one of us have something, something to uh, uh, learn from this conference. So I'm for all these things, I mean, it did not come just, but by the effort and spending time on it. I'm very thankful to all members in the committee for contributing for the development of the academic program for this conference, sharing their experience, and as well uh, to Dr. Saraji uh, for, uh, um, for uh, I mean, spending a lot of her time, a lot of her effort in communicating with the uh, speakers as well as uh, in looking into all the organization aspects of this conference. Uh, so at the, uh, 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 not at last, uh, not at least, but uh, lastly, let me thank all resource persons who agreed, who uh, willingly agreed to share their knowledge, expertise with all of us for the benefit of uh, our uh, own citizens so that uh, we would little move little forward in rehabilitation or rehabilitating uh, the affected among us in our community. So with that brief uh, introduction for the other uh, conference and with regard to our committee, let me conclude by wishing success for all the academic programs that will be conducted over the next two days. And let me invite all of you to uh, be with us, to remain with us over two days and to make the maximum use of this conference uh, over the next two days. Thank you very much for your patient attention. Thank you, Madam. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's time to start our first symposium. Uh, so you have had a lot of uh, idea about what this conference is for and what is their objectives. So we'll be starting with children. So new, uh, the first symposium uh, is on neurodevelopmental care for children. And I have my co-chair, Dr. Takshila Senviratna, uh, who is a senior registrar in medical rehabilitation. And uh, we have three speakers lined up uh, in this symposium. Uh, first speaker, uh, I'm going to introduce the first speaker. She is Dr. Uh, Dilini Vipulaguna, who is a community pediatrician attached to RDHS Kampaha. Uh, so she is doing a lot of uh, community work with regard to this neurodevelopmental uh, pediatrics. And so Dilini is uh, going to talk about the approach of neurodevelopmental disorders in children. Mostly, uh, she's covering uh, the community aspect of it. Over to you, Dilini. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Dilini Bukhara and I'm a consultant community pediatrician. First of all, I'd like to thank the expert subcommittee on medical rehabilitation in Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting me to give this talk. Today, we are going to focus on approach to neurodevelopmental disorders in children. So I will be talking about what are the neurodevelopmental disorders and what are the risk factors for them. 
and how we detect them early and the principles of management and we'll have glimpse at some of common neurodevelopmental di disorders depend on the time uh, limits now if you focus but on neurodevelopmental disorders neurodevelopmental disorders are uh, defined as multifaceted conditions and you will have impairments in cognition, communication, language, speech, behavior, motor skills, memory, learning, and other neurological function. So you could see these are impairments in major developmental domains or the domains you need to learn and function in day-to-day -day life. Now these developmental disorders occur due to abnormal brain development and they will, as I said, result in impairment in their personal, social, academic or occupational function. Most of these neurodevelopmental disorders manifest early in developmental period and typically persist across the lifespan. Now different these neurodevelopmental disorders can coexist in one child and the symptoms could include deficits in certain areas as well as excessive uh, features. Now, these are very common neurodevelopmental disorders that you would come across in the clinical practice. The commonest would be autism spectrum disorder, where we talk about uh, in US now having one in 44 as prevalence, and ADHD, language disorders, learning disabilities, intellectual impairment, cerebral palsy. Again, uh, in uh, in developing countries, it's estimated about three to four children per thousand would be having cerebral palsy. And uh, the other motor disorders like developmental coordination disorders and then impairments and vision and hearing. And we come across in a lot of Western countries, alcohol related neurodevelopmental disorders, as well as things like tick disorders. Now, why these neurodevelopmental disorders occur? So we know that we have the genetic and environmental contribution in our final makeup. So the genetic component is there when the brain develops. However, the exterior shapes the building architecture. So in a child, at the, since the time of conception, the neurological pathways, the synapses form with the experience. So whenever you have more experience the synaptic formation is quite stronger as you can see and if you do not use certain parties those synaptic formations will actually lose its um, strength and they will actually uh, disappear so this is how the brain is formed in early developmental period now this experience dependent synapse formation is happening very quickly or in a very rapid rate within first few months of life as you can see it is very famous uh, uh, graphical representation now the the synapse formation occur very rapidly in first few months and then they come to a plateau state within first few years so within about five years most of the functions are being coming into a plateau state so now we know the genetic and environment factors are important uh, in build-up as well as when the things go wrong it's again the genetic and environmental factors that matter so when the the certain adversities occur during early period from genetic or environmental side depending on where it affects in the brain you will have a different neurodevelopmental disorder now, again, it's very important to know epigenetics play a major role. So it's, it's a very common um, phenomenon in neurodevelopmental disorders that the epigenetic switch due to environmental factors. So whether you are going to have certain features or not are switched on based on the environmental factors you have. Now, these are the common uh, etiological risk factors uh, because there's a huge genetic component there's always some certain 
uh, sort of positive family history and then certain genetic syndromes are associated with uh, common neurodevelopmental disorders for instance uh, trisomy 21 and muscular dystrophies are commonly associated with uh, and things like tuberous sclerosis are commonly associated with autism spectrum disorder and advanced parental age prenatal maternal nutrition so having anemia or you know micronutrients like zinc deficiency and then uh, prenatal exposure to substance drugs and toxins are very common so lead drugs like SSRIs and epileptics and maternal medical conditions like diabetes male gender uh, having uh, you know male gender is kind of controversial whether it's uh, uh, it's a debate whether the, the females are under recognized in neurodevelopmental disorders and then low birth weight, low gestational age, good attitudes, postnatal complications like hypoxia, hypoglycemia, uh, are well, you know, well established association as well as having higher BMI, children who are looked after or in the care and also the, the etiologies and immune activation are being discussed. Now, a recent systematic review actually said about uh, neurodevelopmental disorders fluctuate globally between 4.7 to 88.5. So there's a huge variation across the globe. And uh, these are based uh, on the, the challenges in detection, the reporting, as well as different uh, diagnostic criteria being used in different parts of the world. So, why do we need early detection? Now, we know the importance of neuroplasticity about brain development. So, we know that having early detection will help us to build new neural pathways in the brain and that will help to improve the outcomes. So the main basis behind early detection is looking at child's development as a whole. So we know child development occurs as a sequence in these different areas, motor communication, social, emotional, and cognition. So detecting unusual features in child development will often help to detect these neurodevelopmental disorders early. Now, how this happens, uh, developmental screening and surveillance is the commonest way that we can detect developmental disorders. So developmental screening is a universal thing that you will look at the developmental milestones at different ages. The surveillance is more for high-risk infants. And then we also need to look for red flags for neurodevelopmental disorders, which I will be touching on later in my presentation. And then there are specific diagnostic assessments for different neurodevelopmental disorders that would be useful for early detection. Okay, so you detect a neurodevelopmental disorder. So what are the principles of managing a neurodevelopmental disorder in child? Now, there are several principles that we talk about when we do manage children with uh, the neurodevelopmental disorders. Number one is our interventions, because now there are more and more literature available on how we detect and manage these neurodevelopmental disorders compared to previous anecdotal practices. So always, always, always your practices should be evidence-informed and evidence-based. So there are plenty of uh, management guidelines across the globe where you would uh, refer to and always your management should be evidence and evidence-based. Second principle, the early detection and early interventions are keys. So we are talking about developmental disorders occur due dysfunctions in developmental pathways of brain formation. So utilizing the brain plasticity, where still the brain is forming new pathways, you can alter the route of how the child's outcome will be if you detect very early and intervene early for brain to adapt for new things. Third uh, principle is neurodevelopmental disorders are managed not as usual 
of like a medical condition it's quite different we are looking at multidisciplinary approach we are looking at interdisciplinary discussions we are looking at family-centered approach so that is what we really need to remember second thing the other thing is we always have a goal-based approach so we look at different goals and we work towards working and working at those goals not very blindly approaching or managing the child with neurodevelopmental disorders most of these interventions happen in home-based environment which should be very enriched and family-centered approach so that is very important and this is the other important principle so we always base our management principles on international classification of functioning disability and health children and young uh, people version and the same thing was reintroduced by canadians using f words so we do not only focus on body structure and function but we look at the activity limitation and participation so we look at child holistically and we try to modify environmental and personal factors while managing, you know, limiting the activity impairment and improving the participation of the child. So that is how you look at the child's future. Now, I thought we'll have some glimpse into uh, very few neurodevelopmental disorders. So, this is a child born at 32 weeks, had intrauterine growth restriction, sepsis, and needed mechanical ventilation, and then followed up by 12 baby clinic, had delayed motor milestones, but then reassured there's only a uh, prematurity. However, this child did not have any developmental regression, and the neuroimaging showed postnatal ultrasound, uh, of postnatal ultrasound, periventricular leukomalacia. So in examination, you can see she has what they call aquinas gait, finally, and also you can see the left arm is not swinging as much as the right. So there is a asymmetry there, and uh, also she had the features of spasticity, dystonia, and hyperreflexia. So this is very uh, Easy diagnosis, however, unfortunately, we have missed until about later in life. So the diagnosis is cerebral palsy. However, how do we try to limit the late diagnosis? So now there are international guidelines to tell if the child has high risk, uh, if child belongs to high risk infant uh, who had perinatal risk factors, then we will have. Uh, standardized motor assessment and standardized neurological assessment to come to a diagnosis of cerebral palsy within the first five months of uh, life. And even after five months, you have certain uh, red flags recommended to look at the developmental milestones, particularly asymmetry in limb movements and hand preference before one year of age, and then uh, not able to sit without support by nine months of age. So certain things like this should again direct you to early diagnosis of cerebral palsy. And then autism, I won't be discussing in very detail because my colleague IND will be doing one complete session on this. However, we need to remember there are again certain red flags we need to look at when they are started with autism. For instance, like not responding to name by first year of life, just not having pretend play at least by one and a half year of life are major risk factors of autism. Now, this is again a baby, a term baby who had uh, difficulties uh, in establishing feeding and then had documented hypoglycemia, presenting at four months with poor social interactions and poor social smart. So these are the concerns of parents. And you can see the baby is not focusing on the toy, which is quite in front of his face. So there's significant visual inattention. And now you can see baby is focusing on a picture and baby is actually fixing and following. So what is the difference? The baby is now in a darker environment with little uh, object. So this is 
the cerebral or cortical visual impairment and this baby is having what we call phase one so they don't even recognize uh, objects when they don't have visual attention for objects now when we talk about cerebral or cortical visual impairment there are certain visual behaviors like we showed and this happens due to the the problems in those ventral stream uh, uh, of the visual pathway now important things to remember is these children often would come with a normal ophthalmological evaluation, but still they don't have uh, proper vision. So perinatal hypoxia and hypoglycemia are major risk factors for this. And uh, I would again show something. Uh, so this is uh, again a, a girl born at 30 weeks and needed ventilator support and uh, well, baby clinic only after one year, now presenting at five years with delayed speech and poor attention. And you can see this child was pointing to things uh, in this picture. Now, if I go back to the previous picture, you can see there are more, there are more uh, white, white and, you know, contrasting kind of uh, pictures here, even though it's a complex picture, so she's able to point out very nicely. But uh, if I take this to the very beginning, you can see she's looking down from her eyes. So she's looking at a lower uh, visual field. And then when it comes to a very complex picture, you may see now she finds it difficult. Now she has moved towards the bow and then she rotates her head to bring out the preferable visual field to look at the things and now she finds it difficult to point out the, to the questions that are asked in a very complex picture. So this is cortical visual impairment phase three where yeah, you will most of the time find children coming with uh, learning difficulties, poor attention because they cannot see very complex pictures but day-to-day -day life they function otherwise well. Okay, so these are some of the common neurodevelopmental disorders and then uh, some, I, I try to touch very basic ones. So thank you very much for your time and listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And this is my email address. You can again send me emails if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Dilini, for that. My name is Dr. Dilini and I'm a very informative session uh, on approach to neurodevelopmental disorders in children. Uh, so I just want to tell you that if you have any questions, you can type it in the chat box and that we will take it up at the end of the symposium where all three speakers will be available. So please do so if you have any questions. And I would like to invite Dr. Takshila, my co-chairperson, uh, to introduce the next speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Ayanthi Suniviratna. She is a speech therapist uh, at the IP National Center for Rehabilitation of uh, Children. And she will talk to us on speech therapy perspective of Autism spectrum disorders. Over to you, Ms. Ayanri. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ayanri Seniviratna. I'm a speech and language therapist from the IIP Center. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving me this opportunity to actually speak about uh, the perspective of uh, speech therapy in autism spectrum disorders. So today we will be talking a little bit about um, the diagnosis itself, autism, and some of the red flags that we see, um, a bit about autism intervention and types of intervention, and some of the best outcomes we can hope for our kids. A recent study suggests that um, the prevalence of autism is one in 93 children in South Asia. So what really is autism? Um, this is actually, it's a diet where there are two different uh, 
areas that are affected. One is social and communication difficulties. And here you will see a lot of uh, deficits in social emotional reciprocity where they have difficulties in back and forth conversations. Uh, we will also see difficulties in maintaining and sustain, uh, sustaining social relationships. Uh, they might also have poor uh, integrated verbal and nonverbal communication where they're not able to use facial expression, eye contact, etc. The other part is your RRBs, the restricted and repetitive behaviors. This is the, um, you would see this in kids such as, uh, just like the picture suggests, where they have lining up of toys, uh, wanting to do the same thing over and over again. Um, also, it could be um, that they don't like sudden changes in their routine. You would see the presentations uh, in children with autism in different ways, especially in the different levels of autism, where the ones who are at a level one who are closer to borderline, you would see things like uh, the restricted interest would be of what they're talking about. For example, they might like to speak about only dinosaurs. Right? They might also like to speak about uh, a particular car. Or if you see their pretend play, their pretend play would be the same routine that is done every single day. There is no change. Uh, so it's very important as SLTs to remember this in your assessment and also in your intervention. They will also have sensory difficulties where they are hyper or hypersensitive to sound, touch, um, taste, etc. So let's quickly run through some of the red flags um, in autism. Uh, you might find that it's very hard to get your baby or your child to look at you. Uh, they might also rarely share enjoyment with you. So what this is, um, what this, what you see is where they won't be saying things like, "I'm a look, Tata, look for coming and giving you a toy to share that enjoyment or share their favorite toy with you." They might also rarely respond to their names. Um, they will have limited use of gestures such as looking and pointing. So this is both ways. They might not point and show things to you or they might also not point your gaze when you tell them, yeah, Baba, look, there's a, um, there's a dog or a cat. They might not follow your gaze. There's also delayed speech or no social babbling or chatting. Um, so it's very important to remember this. So you will have children coming to your clinic and the parents might say, oh, my kid has 30 words. My kid is able to say this and names of colors and names of the alphabet, all of that. Important thing to remember is, are these words or this speech that the child is saying, uh, is it directed at somebody? Is it in context or is it in meaning? with meaning that the child is saying this. Because if usually what children with autism would most likely do is name or label. Uh, so it's very important to ask that question whether it is meaningful. Whatever they're saying, is it meaningful? They might also make odd sounds or have a very unusual tone in their voice. Uh, this is with or without exposure to screen uh, in early stages. And you will find children talking like, either Dora the Explorer or Peppa Pig. Um, so these are some of the things that you could see, some of the red flags. They would also use your hand as a tool. For example, they will take your hand and keep it on a bottle for you to open it or keep it on the fridge, indicating open fridge. Uh, they're more interested in objects than people. So we see this at a very younger age. Uh, where when you show them an object, they are most likely to look at the object uh, rather than the person. So we don't see that joint engagement coming where they look at an object, look at your face or smile or look at the object again. That kind of um, engagement we don't see. So you will see that they're more interested in the objects rather than the person showing it. They have a very unusual way of moving their hands or it sometimes can be the whole body movements. 
uh, they have repeat they repeat unusual movements with objects or they might like to keep a particular object in their hand all the time um, they also might uh, have unusual reaction to sound sights um, and textures so it's very important to um, get the OT support here the occupational therapist support here to do a sensory profile of the kids you see with autism uh, because they might be uh, sensitive to the sound of the blender or some children might not like to walk in a washroom that has bought everywhere or different types of textures, surfaces. So it's also very important to get the occupational therapy support um, at this juncture. So just to talk about and uh, look at a video of what we've already spoken about, uh, I'm going to show you two videos, right? And I want you to observe both videos, these uh, children, the two children I'm going to show you are roughly around the same age and a few months apart, actually. Uh, one has autism and the other is a typical kid. I just want to observe, want you to observe his social communication. Let's see. Okay. Okay, so can you see how this little kiddo is shifting his attention from the object to the person and is also trying to initiate, um, initiate a conversation by uh, sharing the toy or sharing that enjoyment with the toy or requesting for help to wind the toy up again and give it um, to the caregiver here. Now I want you to um, watch the next video. how um, this kid is very much interested in the object and not at the mom or the speech therapist on the side right so towards the end of the video you will see the speech therapist going hop 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 but the child did not um, look at the face the child did not share that enjoyment but was overly interested in just the penguin so you see the differences between the two videos and here in these two videos, what I want to focus was the nonverbal um, communication in these two kids. So when do we intervene and why is it so important when we intervene? Um, so you can see that the first three years uh, in a child's brain has up to twice as many synapses as it will have in Adulthood. So you, what you're seeing here is the synapse formation at the newborn stage and up to two years, right? So the genes actually provide the basic wiring for the brain, but it also allows the environment fine tune it, right? And this environment is you and I. So before the age of three, you and I or the communication partners, teachers, the community, we all have a great responsibility and we can make a positive impact in these kids, right? So it's very simple, like for example, when the child says, shows you an object and you tell the name of an object, of that particular object, the language areas in the child's brain is activated. So the more you say the name or the more the input increases, you will see that these synapses between neurons are activated more. So which is why we say the early stages before the age of three is 
vital in autism intervention because that is when we can make an impact or that is when we can make a change in a child's life. So now we talk about uh, autism intervention. Um, so in the past four or five years, roughly, uh, we've seen that accessing services, not only for autism, for any type of uh, uh, childhood disability, we've seen that it's very challenging, in, especially in low middle income countries. And since of late, it has been even more challenging due to, due to multiple reasons. One could be, and even right now, you and I, you also might be um, facing some of these challenges. For example, uh, difficulties in accessing services due to the distance, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the availability of services, availability of professionals, sometimes services um, are months apart, the appointments are months apart. And of course, right now, the current crisis causing people, uh, people are unable to come uh, to us because of the fuel issue and all that, right? So recent, um, if you look at the recent uh, literature or evidence, it talks a lot about all these early intervention packages for ASD. And one main area that they focus on is caregiver training. Okay. Uh, it's, it's so vital and we do this at um, IFP as well. We have parent training sessions for autism. This is one way we can manage our numbers. Okay. So you and I have been used to synchronous methods in the past, but now we have adapted asynchronous methods where we do see parents face to face, but also we have this um, video based um, telehealth system where they send us videos of them interacting with their child and we provide feedback at our and their convenience. Um, so here at IIT, all parents who come here, we make sure we do the QCIT. It is an adapted version of the quality of care given child interactions for infants and toddlers. Uh, it focuses on three main areas, social emotional development, cognitive development, and language development. If you, um, if you wish to know more, please, please do email and I will share the uh, forms with you. Uh, this is something where we use to train our caregivers. Uh, apart from that, we also do the uh, Denver rating. We do the early start Denver model for young children with uh, autism. This is on a five point rating scale. And you can see there are 13 skill areas that we focus on. So I would just want to take you through just one specific area, which is the first one, management of the child's attention. It gives you a brief idea about what they mean by this. And like I told you, it's on a five point rating scale. So you know exactly where the parent and the child is at. So we do it at baseline level. And as we progress through therapy, we do it in between as well to see where we are. Uh, we have found this to be very, very um, effective. Um, so you will see that most of our intervention is focused on now if you take an activity the external features of an activity whatever it might be right a book reading a play um just messy play sensory play even even an academic activity right and also it focuses on the caregiver's approach to the activity caregiver communication skills caregiver behavior management so you will see a lot of caregiver 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 coming through which is because we give a lot of weight to our caregivers, our parents, or whoever it might be who takes care of the child. And here, remember that one of the deficit areas is social communication. They are going to have difficulties in social communication. So we need good models to show these children how you are able to communicate with other people. Right? So how do we structure therapy? It actually is on a continuum of naturalness. So you have your clinician directed approaches that we are very used to the ABA, the descriptive training, all of that. And then you have your child directed, which is the Hannah, which is the focus language stimulation, the facilitated language techniques all coming in. So you will see it's from the more least natural to the most natural, right? And your hybrid approaches coming in between. 
in the middle, which is your pre-linguistic milieu, etc. So what we focus a lot is on the more natural ways of uh, therapy, where we focus a lot on very functional goals. And also we found that children who are at a level one and a two, not the very severe children, you need to focus a lot more on the hybrid and child directed approaches because they are going to be prompt driven if not you have to prompt them to do something it's not going to be spontaneous so the more natural approaches would give you the more natural spontaneous language coming out so what are some of the best outcomes we could hope for our kids right so early identification and intervention is key um, if you do identify before the age of three, there is a massive amount of input that you can do. Evidence-based clinical practice is the other. Right? Evidence is changing. Day by day. I mean, what we've learned or what we've done in the past is all to do with where it's children coming to therapy and you would do a session for 45 to one hour, 45 minutes to one hour, and then they go back with home based targets. But now evidence of clinical practice is evolving and they say within the session, it's vital that you train parents and parents do whatever the targets that you want in your session. So which comes to our next point, which is parent training. Um, I don't have much time to talk about parent training that we do here at IIT, but we do have um, a program where all parents who are identified at the beginning would go through this and also social skills training and functional goal setting. This is, if you think of the ICF framework, you know that we focus a lot on the activity and participation. You need all your goals to be functional at the end of the day. So these are some of the best outcomes that we could really hope for our kids. Um, so thank you for listening. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Irene, for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put in the chat box. We can answer those uh, at the end. So next, I would like to invite um, Dr. Jayatri Tagoda, consultant uh, rheumatologist and rehabilitation at the uh, Lady Gateway Hospital, Colombo, to talk to us on Rehabilitation of muscle disease in children. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Tachila, for the uh, kind words of introduction. And thank you for giving me this opportunity 
today to talk on this topic. Uh, in fact, uh, when Saraji told me that I need to um, talk on something, I myself picked up this um, topic because <clears throat> we don't talk about this much. And uh, but we see a, a big cohort of children having uh, muscle disease. <clears throat> In the sense, we <clears throat> talk commonly of muscle disease. That's a uh, uh, majority of them have muscular dystrophies, the sheen and other um, muscular dystrophies. Uh, and there are other metabolic uh, myopathies and rare genetic myopathies. But the prototype uh, of this uh, entity, I would like to talk on um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy because the cohort is large there. I see in a week about um, four to five children and then we have another clinic dedicated for them once a month. I do, uh, we see patients with Dr. Kara and myself, we see in a team. So this is uh, quickly going on to the topic. This is uh, if you take uh, BMD, it's a progressive disease, degenerative disease, and um, uh, two to three years old, if they, uh, they are two to three years old when they present uh, with uh, calf hypertrophy and first signs of Gavers, and then they are wheelchair bound by 12, about 12 years, and then um, ultimately uh, it was the case earlier about 20 years old, they will be ultimately wheelchair bound and die with uh, cardiac or respiratory uh, dysfunction. Uh, but now that was um, earlier, but now um, the scope is changing. There are a lot of, uh, you know, early detection, improved detection and management, including uh, the treatment with steroids and other um, disease modifying drugs, disease modifying drugs, which is not my my uh, uh, area to talk. So uh, what I mean is, with the advent of uh, you know these meds, these children are living into adulthood. So they have um, improved physical and uh, functional status, long survival, and then successful transition into adulthood. So it is uh, fully worthwhile looking at the, these children early because we need to intervene early to make them tra their transition to adulthood um, as better uh, functioning individuals. And also because they have long survival, it's our duty to make sure that they uh, uh, don't suffer when they uh, enter the adulthood with this uh, disabling illnesses. So we need to anticipate. Anticipatory preventive rehabilitation management is essential to ensure better quality of life. So it is very important because they are now surviving. So um, that there are a lot of advances in adaptive equipment and assistive technology also. So uh, their participation in adult life is also improved. So there are three uh, identifiable stages in this disease. Uh, this is common to other muscular dystrophies as well. Um, any degenerative muscle disease, um, we would be able to identify these three key stages, early stage, transitional stage, and late stage. So early ambulatory stage, um, there will be muscle weakness, especially the hip extensors, ankle dorsiflexors, hip abductors, hip adductors, and abdominals will be weak and they uh, we'll have show, start showing signs of uh, the weaknesses and the compensations for that. So they also have neck and upper extremity weakness that might not be obvious unless tested. For example, if you try to pull them to uh, sit um, holding with two hands, their head might be lagging, but you may not notice that. So, but other compensations you might notice. So. Early uh, ambulatory stage, there are, there are muscles at risk of, uh, you know, um, shortening. Uh, the uh, muscles that are at highest risk is two joint muscles or stabilizers, like plantar flexors, hip flexors, and alutibial bands. They cross uh, their stabilizers, so they tend to tighten up early. So then uh, these children show compensation. So uh, for these uh, weaknesses, uh, compensatory mechanisms, they uh, tend to, you know, lean posteriorly and increase, there is increased lumbar lordosis, keeping the line of gravity behind the, trying to 
keep the line of gravity behind the hip. So um, they waddle, um, they uh, waddle because of the proximal muscle weakness and trying to balance the uh, center of gravity. And they have swaying trunks and uh, they might lack heel strike and then they will uh, compensate for that by leaning forward again. Um, and they might have decreased cadence. Uh, cadence uh, is the number of steps per each minute. So they will show Gower's manure if you uh, um, test for that. And uh, this picture gives you um, rough uh, uh, guidance, the appearance of these children in uh, you know, uh, late childhood. So in, then they come to this transitional stage where the muscle weakness uh, deepens for the weakness of affected muscles, the same muscles that I mentioned earlier. And then uh, here the trans, in the transitional state, the most crucial uh, muscle that is uh, going to be weak is quadriceps, which determines whether they are going to walk or not. So it is the key to gait deterioration. And uh, then ankle everters are also um, now getting weak. Huh? Uh, like the peroneal muscles. So, which uh, leads to a picture like this. So, uh, you can see this boy, he's trying to, you know, walk um, with a broader gaze, uh, much more noticeable anterior pelvic tilt. And um, because they are trying to keep the line of gravity in front of the knee and behind the, la behind the lateral to the hip at the same time. So, they, they show different now the compensatory mechanisms uh, are more obvious. Uh, they broaden the base of support or balance and also due to tight iliotibial bands now and ankle plantar flexion and inversion. Now, uh, earlier stages, they only have equinus, but then they eventually get um, inverted ankles also. So, and this, all this may increase tendency to fall. This may be the time uh, sometimes, unfortunately, they present. Uh, this picture shows the changes that I have mentioned in the ankles, the equinus deformity and the ankle inversion. So these are early deformities. So by this time, uh, before these things happen, we need to intervene uh, because um, they are going to, if they are going to survive into adulthood, these are going to cause a lot of problems later. So then later stage, uh, there is deepening muscle weakness, very profound weakness. And now the upper extremity weakness also more significant. Uh, elbow extension is weaker than flexion, so pronation is weaker than pronation. And wrist and finger extension also get affected, but distal weakness comes, to the, comes as the last thing. So, uh, and also uh, much uh, uh, worsening muscle contractures. Uh, and there is accelerated lower limb contractures and uh, also upper limb muscles also get tight uh, and they also develop scoliosis if, uh, if we don't manage them well. So this uh, picture shows what has happened to these ankles if um, left untreated uh, at the early, uh, not ended at the early stage, which will um, cause a lot of problems when they when they are going to plant their feet on the floor for passive standing and all. So it's very important that we act early. So, so later stage compensations, um, before loss of ambulation, most compensations are for maintaining ambulation. So I have seen children uh, reaching their thighs through their trouser pocket. So, so they put the hand into their trouser pocket and they support themselves um, just to keep the ambulation going. We have tried KFOs and many other devices. This, the child couldn't walk with that, but he uh, walks only with these compensatory mechanisms he's finding for himself. So it is um, before loss of ambulation. So after loss of walking, uh, the, they are trying to keep stability in sitting and uh, to keep the upper limb function. So then compensatory mechanisms fail eventually with development of deformities around the ankles and knees, kyphoscoliosis, breathing difficulty, and cardiac problems eventually can uh, ensue. So, so we need to do comprehensive assessments to, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
intervene early. So they are ideally done in uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, clinics and team meetings and individual assessments brought together in, in these meetings. It yeah, should be in keeping with ICF model. I hope everybody is familiar with the ICF model. Uh, that should be done at least every six months and more frequently if more problems are detected and need to happen throughout the lifespan. So a team should be looking after these um, children who go into right into adulthood and uh, through entire through the throughout the entire lifespan. Um, um, I don't have to uh, you know lie to you. This is uh, we are not in a position in Sri Lanka to give this. So our rehab colleagues should come back and um, you know take these people through their entire lifespan. So. This assessment will help us to plan rehab intervention. So this is the ICF classification uh, functional uh, model. So we're not going to go through that. So assessment, uh, there can be, there are many different assessment tools which we can um, use, functional assessment, patient record outcome, quality of life measures. Uh, so if you use the same menu uh, measures over the time, including new assessments as appropriate to monitor changes and support anticipatory management. So there are a whole lot of whole array of assessments, which I'm not going to go through. I just would like to show you, it's like GMFCS. So this is the gross motor uh, ambulation function classification, AFCSD, used for uh, children with um, Duchenne. So there are so many other things in different domains um, to assess. So contractures and diminished muscle extensibility is due to lack of full active joint range of motion uh, and due to static positioning. They are just sitting there. They love to sit in one place and not to move anything. Um, so uh, all these um, um, problems lead to more contractures. So muscle imbalance, weakness across the joints, and this fibrotic changes in the muscles, they can begin uh, in the newborn period itself. So you can, you can appreciate the gravity of things that um, when um, uh, the things start getting uh, accelerated, when the child is less ambulatory, the late stage, everything start happening uh, in an accelerated uh, way when they are less mobile. So, so prevention of contractures and deformities require multiple coordinated interventions. Why these interventions are uh, needed, I told, they, before the ankle and uh, uh, especially the ankle contractures, before these things happen, we need to uh, uh, act. So active and or active assisted elongation should be done to keep the uh, range of motions. So daily passive stretching of joints, muscles, and soft tissues at risk for tightening. And those are identified by assessment. So they need prolonged elongation. So, um, you know, this might, uh, you know, clash with uh, our uh, concept of not, uh, stretching is not good in cerebral palsy, but here you need to stretch and this uh, stretch should be prolonged. So support of optimal positioning throughout the day with splinting, orthotic intervention, standing devices, custom seating and, mobile and mobility devices and adaptive equipment is needed to keep these uh, people going. So, so if we think of assistive and adaptive devices, so AFOs, we need to know how to use AFOs and what is the use of AFOs, why typically they are not indicated for use during ambulation. I showed you how their ankles are getting contracted. So in cerebral palsy, we use AFOs to ambulate, that ambulating children should wear the uh, AFO while ambulating, but in here it is not the case. So they, uh, this is, uh, these AFOs in these children are used to keep the range of motion. So they tend to, if they would use it in ambulation, they tend to limit the compensatory movements needed for efficient ambulation. The child will get it uh, difficult to ambulate and it will add weight and then compromise ambulation because we need to keep them ambulating as long as possible. So AFOs will make it difficult to rise from the floor and climb stairs. So we need to know how to use these devices in each case. So AFOs in muscle disease is to wear for rest, wear at rest. So during the late ambulatory stage, you can use KA force also with locked knees can prolong ambulation, but uh, uh, with use, uh, they, they also show decreased mobility. So 
resting or stretching uh, uh, AFOS, uh, they are mainly for nighttime use. So those who are not familiar with AFOS, I have put a picture there. They prevent and minimize progressive plantar flexion contractures. They appropriate throughout life. So um, if nighttime tolerance cannot be achieved, use of stretching AFOS during non-ambulatory non portions of the day. Daytime AFOs can be appropriately used for full-time wheelchair users, extending into adulthood. So uh, keeping the anchors are very important because they need to use the uh, plant, the uh, anchors down for passive standing. So KAFOs, what is the use of KAFOs? They are um, going to support for standing and limited ambulation for therapeutic purposes. So that you can ambulate with support for therapeutic um, purposes, prevent contractures and deformities in late ambulatory and early non-ambulatory state as um, resting splints. So, so they, they can prolong ambulation for two to four years with, uh, with or without accompanying surgery. So they are associated with decreasing scoliosis in this uh, in muscle disease like uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. No braces can stop scoliosis happening. Uh, what is stopping your getting scoliosis is proper alignment and proper positioning and seating and prolonged ambulation. If you can ambulate your patient for a longer time, you are going to prevent scoliosis. Nothing else. You can't brace. Even if you brace, the uh, uh, scoliosis will not stop. So K4 help in that way to keep prolonged ambulation because they are uh, helpful as uh, passive stretchers and uh, assisted ambulators. So greater success with experienced teams in the absence of obesity because um, uh, these uh, use of devices, you need to uh, you have some experience to prescribe these things for what patient, which uh, device to use. So, so KFOs continue to be an appropriate option, option in some context because more reported cases of KFOs use with glucocorticoids and prolonging ambulation to even older ages. Now, I told you the lifespan is going to be longer now. So, family satisfaction and um, Sometimes it's only for supported standing, but still they are useful. So they they are used for uh, is more therapeutic rather than functional. You are not using them for walking. Uh, so care should be taken to support uh, safety to minimize the risk of falls and not to um, not used exclusive of motorized mobility, which is typically provided simultaneously or earlier for safe, optimal functional independence. So these um, uh, in other countries, even if we don't use it, they are using a lot of, uh, you know, uh, motorized ambulation for these children, the people, because they have a very functional brains. So they, um, they are uh, disabilities only physical. So in early ambulatory stage, you can wear lightweight manual mobility, you can use lightweight manual mobility devices for pushing the child on occasions when long distance mobility demands exceed endurance. So, um, so I think I have to rush my slides uh, due to the time constraint. Um, so the idea of motorized uh, ambulation or uh, transportation of these uh, people uh, should be used because they should not be exerted in an undue manner because that can uh, make them uh, make their muscles deteriorate. So standing devices are equally important because uh, in these uh, cases, they don't stand actively, uh, but they are uh, bone health to be, to be preserved and a lot of advantages in standing positions. Your, uh, your lungs, your gut, your sphincters are going to work more and the person gets uh, to look at the world from a higher position. So uh, standing has a lot of advantages. So standing should be, uh, passive standing should be done uh, as long as possible that they can tolerate. So these are pictures. Um, two pictures of standing devices for serial casting. So these options are there. We should know how to and when to use serial casting. Serial casting is an option. Uh, uh, I showed you these ankle contractures. So uh, when instances like this, obviously the child cannot uh, plant the feed, obviously then he cannot uh, stand using KA force. Uh, it's not, it's forbidding, um, uh, it's uh, inhibiting or blocking the way 
of passive standing. So in such instances, we can ask the um, talk to the orthopedic surgeon and uh, get his advice also for serial casting uh, without surgery. Serial casting is one good thing that we can use. If you can use light based casts, um, we can even uh, get them to stand while the cast is on. So that's an option that we can use. Um, so exercises in the DMD, this is a debate. There's a debate exercises to do or not to do. 